African representative team. And we'll be leading the discussion today alongside my colleagues, Bronte and Lynn, who will be moderating the panel today with the Global Lecture Series team. Before we begin our session, I just want to touch briefly on the International Working Group for Health System Strengthening. We are a collective of emerging professionals in the public health space from around the world. On this call today, we have our members and their institutional colleagues joining us from across six different global regions, namely from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, Johns Hopkins University in the United States, the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, the Indian Institute of Health Management Research in India, the University of Philippines, Manila, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the London School of Economics in the UK. You will hopefully all meet each other in the breakout rooms. Our mission as an organization is to unite the next generation of strategic thinkers and innovators around the world to co-create equitable and sustainable solutions for complex health systems challenges. Today's panel session is the second event in a virtual global lecture series we are hosting throughout 2021, which aims to draw from a range of diverse perspectives on regional and global health systems issues, specifically in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. And now on to my colleague, Bronte. Hello, everyone. We are so delighted to have you all join us today, um, especially our three very special panelists. Um, so we will start off with our panel, gaining some insights from, from our panelists and then move on to a Q&A session. Um, and after that, we will disperse into breakout rooms. So we encourage you to make this an interactive session that you can learn from please post any question you have in the Zoom chat box and we will be answering those in the last 10 minutes of the session just before we go into breakout rooms. So please don't hesitate to, to ask us anything. Um, and we really hope you can stay for the breakout rooms because it's always so interesting to learn from other health systems members from across the globe. Um, so it promises to be a very interesting and collaborative conversation in those breakout rooms. We do hope you can stay for that. Um, we're going to swiftly hand over to our panelists, uh, Dr. Leanne Brady, Pamela Sawana, and Nadia Maiman. Can you give us a wave? <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Um, these three individuals have been part of what they've called a community action network, um, also known as CANS. So if you hear that word in the panel, that's what we are referring to. And this was initiated by a group of teachers, doctors, and artists in early 2020 in the wake of the um, very strict level five lockdown restrictions in Cape Town, South Africa, um, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the collective aimed to encourage and inspire people from all over the city to self-organize, um, to take local action, and develop ways to share resources in social solidarity. This is developed into 170 functioning community action networks across neighborhoods in Cape Town. And what is incredibly awesome is that the, these networks have shown us how collective action spans bureaucratic boundaries to build systems from the bottom up. And their lessons are very tangible practical examples of how we can really strengthen and enhance health systems from the bottom up. Um, and the South African example, which we're highlighting today has provided a platform for legitimizing community led responses to social and health system challenges. So our first panelist is Dr. Leanne Brady, um, who is part of Cape Town Together and the Salt River Community Action Network. She's a public sector doctor in the emergency medical services in the Western Cape Department of Health. She also works with a range of arts-based methods such as documentary film, photography, poetry, to better engage um, with complex social system issues that impact the health system. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Health Policy and Systems Division at the University of Cape Town. 
Our second panelist is um, Pamela Solana, and she is a member of the Gugu Led to Community Action Network, um, which is also part of Cape Town Together. She is an organizer and activist for the unemployed movement Organizing for Work. Our third panelist is Nadia Maiman, who has been a political activist since the age of 16, spending the last 25 years as a community activist. She currently works as a trading plan facilitator at the Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading um, organization based in Cape Town. And Nadia represents the Born to Healville Community Action Network, which is in partnership with the Joint Peace Forum. And Nadia, I do hope that you can elaborate on that a bit when we, when we ask you. Um, yeah, so as I said, we'll be conducting the panel session. Please um, feel free to engage in the chat box and ask anything that comes to mind. Um, so without any further ado, we'll hand over to Leanne, Pamela and Nadia. And first I'd, I'd like to ask you to just characterize your involvement with Cape Town Together and your community action network in particular, and to also touch on the gaps that the, the can filled in the beginning and maybe the gaps that the can is filming now um, and how it's changed over time. And so Leanne, if you don't mind, we'll start with you and then Pam will move on to you and then Nadia. Thanks so much, uh, Bronte. And yeah, um, nice to meet everybody. I'm looking forward to engaging in the breakaway groups after this. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation to be part of the panel. Uh, I'm part of the Salt River Can, which is where I live. Um, some of the activities we focused on have largely been to address food insecurity, but have also been to kind of keep our corner shops uh, safe and COVID free. So kind of a lot of sort of very hyper local activities here in the Salt River Can. And, um, and obviously Nadia and Pam will talk about the Gogs Can and the Born to Hevel JPF Can as well. Um, I'm gonna just take a, a quick step back just, just for a moment, just to give a bit of context as to how these cans all came about and sort of the, the sort of overall focus of the work. And then, yeah, I'll pass on to my colleagues to give more in-depth um, descriptions of, of the CAN work um, in different areas. So about sort of 10 days before lockdown, a group of people came together um, to grapple with how we would respond to the pandemic. And some of us were from the public health sector, but actually only a few, in fact, three or 3.5, depending on how you classify uh, one of us. Um, and we kind of felt very strongly that it was important to collaborate with organizers and activists right from the beginning. And that was because it was very, it has been very clear in most other sort of um, public health emergencies and other crisis moments that kind of activating um, community led initiatives and supporting community led initiatives is often something that gets left behind. Uh, social mobilization strategies are quite often an afterthought and we really wanted to try and do something different. And so people, it was a, there was sort of a group of about 14 of us in the beginning of people who've been involved in organizing and activism for many years with long histories in organizing in Cape Town um, specifically. And we sort of put our heads together to figure out how we could um, activate, catalyze, support a network of hyper-local community-based groups with the idea being that um, that we are best placed to develop solutions in our own neighborhoods. And quite often you'll see top-down solutions being developed very far from the lived reality of people. And so we really wanted to figure out a way to do things differently. And that was the sort of one of the reasons for the self-organizing network um, that we are now a part of. We're almost a year later, and there've obviously been a lot of things that have changed along the way. But I think I'll stop now um, to hand back over uh, to you, Bronte, to hear more about some of the um, kind of neighborhood-based experiences. Thank you, over. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, Pam, if you don't mind answering this next and maybe giving a bit of background to, to Google later as well, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Pamela Silwana. And I am from a township called Guguletu. And I joined the network somewhere between the beginning of April um, through one of the directors at the organization that I was volunteering at, OFW. 
So when I heard about it, um, I got interested because it was close to um, the president, the three days before the president announced that there was going to be a lockdown. And it had worried us what would happen to people who are unemployed, what would happen to people who are in the informal settlement. Um, so that was our biggest worry. And being told that you won't be able to move around, you're not going to be able to hustle for food or anything. So because I knew the environment I came from, as volunteers and as unemployed people, we started having a meeting and discussing and actually trying to come up with a solution. How do we, um, how do we attack, how do we tackle this, the, um, these problems? And once we joined the network, the network was able to open to us like information, information wise, we're able to know, okay, what is this Corona? Because at that time we didn't know what Corona was, like everybody seemed confused and the information was not reaching everyone, especially us at the bottom, like you would hear. Then I would think if someone is in the shack, informal settlement and doesn't have a TV or a radio, how do they know about Corona, why? So what happened is that um, the doctors in the can were able to um, print um, flyers for us and were able to teach us because we were worried, okay, we should sanitize our hand. We can't basically, can't even afford a sanitizer. So the, no one is thinking of all these um, obstacles for people like we can't keep safe so through the network we're able to learn that okay you can use soapy water even that we're like fine you would think that everybody has soapy water but not everybody has an access to that so that's how we started we started educating people that okay here is water here's soap here's the information um look um this is how you're gonna protect yourself and then what we did was okay so we're done with that. What about food? What about the mothers who can't go to work? Because if every shop is closed, how are we expecting people to eat? So we're like, okay, food is going to be the major, um, is going to be a major problem for people, you know, because health and food actually does go hand to hand. If you're sick and not eating, actually going not to be okay. So we um, responded to um, food. We had 36 soup kitchens at the height of lockdown. And what also happened is that because COVID kind of highlighted more and more problems that people are we're going to have, it was no longer just food. It was going to be a pregnant mother who cannot work and is about to give birth. What do we do? It was about the child who's at home, who cannot go to school, but other people are actually going to school at the other areas. How do we tackle, how do we help that child? So we came together and um, thought of all these problems and um, because of the network and because of the partnership that was that the network um, provided, we were able to join hands and build a relationship so that we can tackle these um, the social ills, the social um, natural disasters, and that's how what we've been doing, yeah, on our side, more and much more. And how has it changed over time? I wouldn't say much has changed, but the capacity to keep on helping has changed because of fatigue and people and some people going to work, but the need is still there. People who are not employed, um, the unemployment actually went up. So meaning that no matter if half of the people went back to work, that means half of the problem is still there. People are still not with food. People are still with needs. So yeah. So now it would be the capacity to keep on helping. That's what has changed on our side. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight, Pam. It's it's really nice to hear your experience and thank you for being so open to share. Um, Nadia, I'll hand over to you for the same question. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Nadia and I'm part of the Bontiable Can. So a um, brief history of Bontiable is that it is a township on the Cape Flats established in 1960 and we predominantly people who were who were relocated from um, upper class areas like Cremont and District 6 um, were forcefully um, removed from those areas and then placed in, in Bontiable. Um, Bontiable is very famous, always in the news, but always for the wrong reasons. Um, although the area has a rich history of activism um, in, the, in the years of apartheid, uh, but 
in the later years became riddled with gangsterism and drugs. Um, the organization, the Joint Peace Forum, Bronte that you referred to earlier, was established in 2014, um, where ordinary community members came of crime and ongoing shootings and killings in the area. Um, it was at this point that um, the Joint Peace Forum um, emerged and subsequently became uh, what we call uh, a pressure group, where we would put pressure on authorities to bring more resources into the area. So when lockdown approached, um, the Joint Peace Forum sat down and we spoke about how we're going to educate the community around the whole pandemic. And we started circulating on social media what this would mean for the community and how it would affect um, our people, basically. Um, not realizing that it was much more than, than, than just um, educating people, because as Pam has said, a lot of people didn't have access to social media. And after when lockdown was announced by the president, um, I think we all assumed that people will be staying indoors. Um, I was termed the lockdown police, uh, shouting at my neighbors to please get inside their houses, just for them to tell me that they cannot stay indoors because they're hungry, they don't have anything to eat. And this prompted us to start our, our daily bread campaign. We reached out to family and friends and asked people to buy extra loaf of bread during this time. Um, I just want to step back a bit right there. And that is that somehow because of our work in the community and our footprint of six years in the Bonjeville community, it was kind of easy for us to organize people. We appointed three champions who would have to nominate people the poorest people in the streets and we compiled the list and the list came to more than 2,500 families that would be in need of food parcels. Um, our, st our street ch champions then in essence became um, our ears and, and eyes on the ground for what is happening. At one point, um, we currently still have 90 street champions that are active and there are 112 streets in Bontiable. So some of our street champions had to go back to work, but we try and make do with what has remained behind. Um, so in some instances, I think the Bontiable community had um, an advantage over the other Cape Town, the, the, the cans, um, but that was basically the only reason. Um, that being said, we were able to do so much through the networking with the Cape Town Together Network. Um, so we started out with our bread distribution, um, 400 loaves of bread every single day we purchased. And, um, and obviously we, 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 we reached out to people out inside and outside of our networks to assist us with generating food parcels. It became very clear very early on that the promises made by the president during lockdown about food parcels and aid coming to communities was going to take a very long time. I think when we heard the, the president's address, we assumed that thousands upon thousands of food parcels will make it into communities and this sadly did not happen. Um, so in essence, we've distributed close to 1,500 food parcels, but early on in lockdown that kind of dried up and we had to move into community kitchens, which initially we didn't want to do because we wanted to encourage people to stay indoors, obviously. But because of the lack of resources coming from government, we had to come together and make plans that will actually suit our community needs. And that was the second pandemic of food. Um, in addition to the food, Pamela mentioned about learners not having access to, to online learning during the time. So we started a learner support group who would get um, learner packs, printed learner packs to parents who did not have access to internet. We assisted with mask making and mask distribution because also we people were required to wear masks but many did not have one. Um, the other thing that we tried to, 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 to do was to set up a community care center in one of our local multi-purpose centers. 
we found that people would not readily go to um, isolation facilities far away from and outside of their communities. Um, and we tried to bring that to pass. Unfortunately, it didn't work out at the time. One of the things that the Cape Town Together Network encouraged was the pairing of better resource communities with lesser resource communities to see how these two communities could then collaborate and work together. We were partnered with the Rhonda Boschkan and um, we've been working very well throughout um, this period. They've been They've been instrumental in raising funds on behalf of the Bancheva community, collecting groceries at the big supermarkets in the area, and also helping with fundraising um, to set up our, our community care center. Um, I think that is all for now. Um, if there's any questions, I will gladly answer that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Nadia and Pam and Leanne. Um, yeah, as I said, it's it's great to learn from you and, and hear about how the response yeah, was quick and and really just for those those huge social needs and gaps in the beginning. So thank you for that insight. I would like to touch on what Pamela mentioned about capacity and I guess going forward. Um, and ideally we have these sort of community-based responses built into how you know, health systems and, and the government thinks about responding to crises. And, and we know that's not necessarily a reality. So I guess my question to you is, how do you think, you know, moving forward, this response is um, planting the seed or, or laying the groundwork for um, community-based um, response to be incorporated in the future? And linked to that is the sustainability of these community action networks. Um, you know, where, where do you see yourself, I guess, going? Um, and what are the, the main, I guess, barriers to, to sustainability of this kind of response? Um, Pam, are you okay to start us off with this, this question? And then Nadia next, and we'll finish with Leah. Okay, so I would say, what was the first question? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, um, it was a long one. How do you think we can incorporate responses like this into crisis responses in the future, basically? Okay, so I would say it hasn't been easy, you know, um, being like I am like the basic, like I am from the ground and I have no background um, knowledge of government um, policies and everything. But because of this network, I was able to have a voice in places where um, um, leaders would talk, organizations, structures that have been there for a very long time. So I think that I am able to influence people in my community to know that even if you are just on the ground, you are able to keep fighting for your voices to be heard, even if you will get gatekeepers and government, anyone that is trying to um, trying to tell you that this is how things are supposed to go. So I think that I am challenging, I'm challenging that, that you know, even the Cape Town Together Network is trying to um, challenge that, that that is not the way to go. It's not been working for a very long time. This is a time to, for a change. And the change is for people like me to keep on pushing and um, being in the spaces and encouraging more and more people on the ground to be the voices for themselves. And that is how I think the change would be. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pam. That's wonderful. Nadia, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I think Bronte for um, history has taught us that top-down decisions made at top level um, doesn't necessarily serve the people on the ground. Um, it is my humble opinion that government should start to relook um, the approaches to many um, of the vices facing communities and maybe consider the bottoms up um, um, approach. Um, we like to say and refer to the song, we don't need another hero. Um, we don't need ward councillors or individuals standing out in, in, in areas. It's more about a, an holistic collective response um, 
where people do things at teams and by consulting people on the ground, obviously they would know what the needs are and how to best um, bring services and resources to those communities. And also people on the ground would, will obviously make sure that these resources actually reaches the people that it should be reaching. Um, we were, I mean, we saw reports of food parcels going here, there, everywhere, except to the communities that, that really needed it. Um, with regard to sustainability, it's very difficult. I doubt that we would have been able as a com community on its own has, would have been able to carry on for a year and longer. It is solely through the, con the, the connecting with the Cape Town Together Network and other cans that we were able to, to come this far. Um, we are heavily reliant on donors, um, but with suffering donor fatigue, um, we can now reaching out to other cans to assist, be it in small ways or however the case may be. But um, if no response from government, I don't know how long the cans would be able to continue. Um, also, you see that some of the cans has to date, um, either they're not existing anymore, although it's a very small handful, but you also find that it's some of the better resource cans that is not active any longer, because really um, cans like Bonjeville and Guguli to Kailicha, we cannot not do the work that we're doing because then we will be sitting with bigger problems at the end of the day and not just with the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive response, Nadia. Yeah, I, I echo your thoughts and, and hearing the voices of the people. Leanne, over to you. Thanks, Bunty. I mean, these are difficult questions, obviously. I mean, for those for those who kind of weren't following, especially colleagues from other countries, the kind of the speed at which this response happened was kind of unparalleled. You know, it went from not existing. Uh, one day to a couple of weeks later, having 170 cans and 20,000 people across the city. <laughs> and I think this kind of that bottom up energy that was rooted in what was needed in the local neighborhood setting could not have been achieved by any government, by any organization. Um, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soup kitchens that popped up as soon as the hard lockdown pushed people into incredibly food insecure situations. and. What we saw were government departments not being able to meet the need fast enough. So we had food parcels in um, in warehouses that just couldn't get to the people who needed them. And then at the very same time, you had kitchens uh, popping up all over and people cooking for their neighbors. And I think that the sort of the speed at which this happened um, is an important lesson to learn from and the kind of responsiveness that allowed for each neighborhood to work differently depending on what was needed there. And this kind of idea that there's no copy paste solutions here actually. And quite often the kind of more top down approaches don't take into account how different um, different neighborhoods are. I think um, the, other, the other kind of really important thing that we saw was this kind of active building of, of solidarity across the city. Because obviously in some way like Cape Town as divided as it is with the ongoing legacies of apartheid and, and, and colonization still being with us every day, finding, figuring out ways to organize across these divides was critical. And I think what we saw during, especially during the first lockdown was really, was really amazing. And it sort of planted seeds of possibilities for the kinds of city we could be building moving forward. Some of those relationships between cans um, will be long lasting and some won't. Um, but I think that the kind of connections between people in neighborhoods, I mean, Pam, you speak about this a lot, um, who would otherwise never have met, but we're now working together collaboratively. And so I think that those sorts of components of the response um, can only be achieved through a very sort of bottom up way of working. And I wanted to just pick up on, on two points, uh, one that you made, Pam, and then one that you made, Nadia. So Pam mentioned sort of getting access to spaces, policy making process spaces um, to share ideas from what was happening on the ground. And we sort of, we termed that kind of approach, bringing professors of the street into the conversation. So there were lots of, and have been lots of professors of epidemiology and lots of professors of clinical medicine, but a lot of those kind of 
um, sort of, I guess, a lot of the forms of evidence that were being used didn't take into account some of the social evidence that we needed. Um, and what was really great, I think, in the beginning of the response was that there was a, there were a lot of opportunities for CANs to engage in some of these policy making processes to inform and discuss some of what was happening um, and then influence processes in very um, and I wanted to pick I think that the community level intelligence generated from a network like this was of extreme value um, during during the response and that's really something to learn from and it's it's somehow different from the kinds of ways in which formal relationship with existing NGO partners um, can operate because these were kind of people who weren't bound by um, the same sorts of financial account of as contracted by government are. So I think the kind of honesty that was allowed and because there were so many organi organizers and activists part of the conversation it brought a very sort of honest truth about what was happening. And then we saw a lot of public health folks acting on some of those, um, acting on that and the, on that community level intelligence, see, trying to grapple with what, what kind of made sense in, in a moment that was chaotic. And I think figuring out how to work with complexity, to go back to the question um, you raised, Bronte, in the beginning, is about being finding ways to be comfortable with that chaos, um, working with all these multiple different forms of evidence, and then seeking to collaboratively find ways to address some of the issues. Um, and then the last quick point I wanted to also mention is what you raised, Nadia, about how we don't need another hero, that actually we're not looking for top-down solutions, we're not looking for individuals, one person to be standing, claiming to solve issues. Actually, what we're wanting to do is to build collective power from the ground up. And I think we don't often see this kind of organizing work interfacing so closely with, with the health system. But if we consider the health system as much more than just the healthcare system, the kind of ways in which we work much more flexibly with informal kind of parts of, or informal, or informal institutions that are community-based, I think is um, something that we still need to learn about, but very promising in how we bring the public back into the public sector. Um, let me stop there, over. Um, awesome, Leanne. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that insight. Um, there's so much to unpack there, but thank you for giving it to us in nice bite-sized chunks. Um, I see we've lost Pam. I'm hoping she'll um, rejoin us soon. But moving on to just our, our final question for the three of you, and then we'll move on to more individualized um, questions. Nadia and Leanne, if there was one take-home message that you had from this entire experience? Um, and I know this is maybe a bit impossible, but first thing that maybe comes to mind here, um, what, what would it be from your experience over the past year with Cape Town Together and the Community Action Networks? Um, what is your take home message that you would like to share with the, the attendees today? Nadia, will, do you mind starting us off? Um, I think the one lesson for me is that we cannot go back to what we assumed was our normal. We need a new normal. Um, going back to the way things were would be absolutely disastrous. I think that we should build on what has been established by the Cape Town Together Network and try and take this forward, establish even more cans um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a response to the COVID pandemic, but um, responses to whatever afflicts our communities as a whole. And what would be great if we can build on that connections that were made during this time. We often speak about building bridges across networks, across race and class. And I think the Cape Town Together Network has proven to us that it can happen. And I think it's important that we should build on that. All for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, Leanne, I don't know if you want to jump in and then I'll rebrief Pam. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I mean, that's an impossible question, Bronte. One lesson, wow, there's so many and we're still learning them. <laughs> 
Um, I think I think for me, given where I sit um, in the health system and as a health policy and systems researcher, I think the the big big lesson for me is is figuring out ways for self-organizing networks like the like like the CANs and other many many community-based um, organizations and institutions, figuring how that's sort of very horizontal way of working and very kind of um, less less formal, less rigid, less bureaucratized way of working that allows for the incredible creativity and responsiveness and care that we've seen. The big lesson is how to um, find ways for that sort of self-organizing network to then interface with, with the health department or with other government departments. And I think in the beginning, we saw a lot of collaboration, which was extremely positive. So because the CANs were so fast, they were developing public health guidance, which actually informed the early um, guidance of the health department. There were multiple sessions where ideas and knowledge was co-produced and shared. And I think as, um, as the kind of what felt to some, I think, like an almost revolutionary type energy. And I mean, Nadia, you've, prepared, you've compared this time to your days in the struggle. There were certain politicians that began to feel quite threatened. And in fact, the, the mayor of Cape Town wrote an article um, where he talks about cans and others as a political threat. And I think as the sort of, as the, as, as the kind of, um, as the politics um, became more complex to manage, the possibilities to contribute in, in positive ways began to shrink. And I think the big lesson is, and I'm not sure how much of these uh, political issues are in fact resolvable, but I think the big, the big lesson is about finding ways to work with those, with those politics because um, it really closed off possibilities for many CANs who were doing incredible work to continue working closely with multiple state sectors um, from different departments. So that would be my, my kind of big, big lesson. Um, I mean, as Nadia said, you know, going back to normal is one of the worst things that could possibly happen. And so this is really a time to be thinking about what we can learn about how we can reimagine the role of the state, both in times of crisis, but also moving forward as well, because this was, of course, was a crisis on a crisis. So I think the lessons, the big lessons are about finding ways to change the ways in which the public sector serves the broader public. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, lots to think about there as well from you and Nadia. Um, Pamela, I know you dropped off for a bit, but we are being very mean and asking you to summarize a, a take-home experience, kind of a, a, a quick single um, take-home message from your experience, um, if you can. <laughs> So I am someone that never actually says one thing. So you will just catch what I'm trying to say. So I had like lots of takeaway homes, like for me, one of them is that I learned that anyone can make a change in the country, regardless if you're unemployed, don't have any resources, anything, you, anyone is capable of having a voice and taking an action to be part of anything that is greater. And I learned that in the country that I live in, like in the city that is divided as Cape Town, I learned and grew to new people that actually said, um, the way that we're living is not okay. So I, know, I now know what I've been seeing is not in my head. The, unequ the inequality, the, 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 the poor places and everything people are actually not okay with that and then there are people who are also wanting that change so I now know that we are not a minority like there are so many people that want to make the change and um, the relationship that the network was able to um to offer what we were able to tackle these this, this, this issues and because of over the past year a relationship that has been built over the past year it's stronger now you know so what divided us now is actually COVID is is, is 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 building relationship with people so that we can be able to be together and make changes so i took away that relationships are important from different clusters of the world to make a change as people are not okay with the world that we're living in yeah mm -hmm. I love that, Pam. Thank you so much. Relationships are so important. Um, Pam, before you mute, I'm just going to ask you a personalized question. And I don't know if you heard a, a lot about what Leanne was talking about, but I know you've been quite vocal 
about, I guess, disrupting these traditional politics um, and the way we're used to, you know, interacting. So I guess I wanted to ask you how you think, maybe not necessarily the Google to can in particular, but definitely speak to your experience, but how do you think the, the network could disrupt the self-serving sort of nature of the local formal authorities and, and government? By continue doing what we're doing and um, continue being together, I think the only thing that is missing in this network is actually um, the resources, like um, financial resources to make the network um, to be able to flow better and to be able to do things much more. Otherwise, I would say being continue building this relationship because once we do build this relationship, we're building an island of love, an island where the we want change. So that is the only way. And then government will be forced to listen to us because we did the work when they kept quiet. So if we continue doing the work and actually overpowering government, then that's what should happen. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, Nadia, I'm, I'm going to move over to you now with a specific question for you. You touched on it in the beginning um, about the can the born to heal or can response being so rapid and good because of your act, the, the activist activity that was sort of happening at the time already and because of the relationships and networks that you had sown in Born to Heal World. Um, but could you maybe elaborate on that, on how your um, activist experience within the community and within, with other activists enabled that um, community action network response? So as explained earlier, the Joint Peace Forum was, was formed in 2014. We had a six year footprint in the area. We had um, a network within our community. We also had this network outside of our community that was um, that has grown to trust the Joint Peace Forum over the over 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 the years, and they've obviously seen what we've been doing. So, uh, even though we are not a registered organization, um, when we decided to become administrators for the Bunchy Volcano, it was easy for us to ask people to donate money, for instance, which we as an organization never used to, to ask in, in, in the past. So now we had the can and we wanted to buy bread and we wanted to buy food. And we now needed to ask people to trust us and, 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 and give money, um, give groceries, give food items. And because of that six year footprint and people knowing what we've been doing in the community for so long, it was easier for us than it might have been for other cans. Also, when it came to the organizing, um, we had street committees um, in the past, and it was easy to re-energize that. It was easy to make contact and know who to contact on what street, uh, because we have this list of street committees that we've been working on for with the, with over the last six years. And this module um, is a module that was used in the years of apartheid. This was how we organized at that time um, through street committees. And it was very, very easy for us um, to do that uh, during the time of the pandemic. And I think that is the reason that I would say that Bonjival kind of had an advantage over other cans because we were able to organize so rapidly. I don't know if I'm answering your question, Bronte, um, but if not, please let me you, know. No, you definitely are. Thank you, Nadia. That is spot on. And I love what you say about trust and how much that links to Pam's ideas of how important these network relationships are. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, Leanne, we're moving over to you for our last question in the panel. Um, and we wanted to know if there is a way that you could see the community action networks in Cape Town together, leveraging the network for vaccine rollout. Um, and yeah, if you you speak about these sort of knowledge sharing and co-learning sessions and health promotion and education, um, is that still being applied to something like vaccine, vaccine rollout um, and have has the, the network been consulted in any way or are we still a bit um, ossified as you say for that? 
Um, so no, the network has not been consulted. And I think, um, I think it would be a real shame not to recognize this incredible network of people um, and the role they could play in building trust in the vaccine, in addressing issues of vaccine hesitancy, in assisting with what's going to be a very complex um, mass vaccination public rollout, but no, CANS haven't been consulted. And my sense is that because there's sort of, because of some of the, the because of some of the ways of thinking of some of our politicians, um, and in particular referring to this issue of some of some of our politicians feeling like CANS are a political threat, I think it's unlikely that we will get invited into um, a space. And so it might be that we have to do what we always do, which is create spaces um, for engagement. We've had a bunch of co-learning sessions already on vaccines. Um, and I think across the cans, as is the case across the broader public, um, people are split on this issue. I think we've not seen, um, what's the best way to say this? We've seen divisiveness amongst cans that we've never seen before when it comes to issues of vaccines. And I think that in and of itself is a very important observation um, and issue to grapple with, you know? I mean, I think it really speaks to the divided nature of the broader public in terms of how they're feeling about the vaccines. Um, the kind of, as, as many of you will know, the um, phase one of the rollout is currently happening and I'm actually involved in that in the public sector. And I think we're learning a lot of lessons um, in terms of addressing some of those issues just amongst healthcare workers. And so I do think it would be important to find ways um, to engage, but yeah, let's let's see, I think, let's see what happens. And you asked two questions. What was the second one? Sorry, I forgot it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you you answered yeah. answered both. Thank you. Thank you so much okay. for that, Leanne. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting times we're in now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lynn, who has a few questions they've chosen from the Q&A box. I, Leanne, I see you've been responding to a few already. Um, but just a huge thanks from my side to Pamela and Leanne, and I see um, Nadia's dropped off, but just for being so engaging and so willing to share your incredible knowledge and insight. So over to you, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. We really learned a lot. Um, really appreciate you sharing all of those incredibly insightful experiences, and I hope that everyone else has enjoyed it too. Um, so we're now going to move on to the live Q&A session. So if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please post them in the chat box now. Um, if it's for a specific panelist or not, everyone can just jump in where they want to. Um, I see we've already got some really interesting questions, so, so thank you. Um, if we could maybe start off with, um, please forgive me for the pronunciation of this name, uh, Ramonde Pacienta had a really good question, I think specifically for, for Leanne. Um, so if you don't mind unmuting yourself from one day and asking Leanne your question, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Thanks everyone. Um, so my question was just about, I think the differences between different cans maybe in how residential they might be. So um, I was just interested to know, and, and for Pamela also, as, as well as Leanne, actually, what's your experience been of just the vagrant folk and homeless people in your areas of the camps in this time? I mean, from my observation, I mean, Woodstock, we, we emptied out and then we filled back up with many more people and definitely not our usual um, sort of known to the area homeless folk. Um, so, so, so the the population of homeless people sort of changed quite a lot over that time, um, and I was just wondering how, like, how did homeless people actually um, factor into your approach? Um, did yeah, th that's that's basically it. Um, how, what has your experience been of of homeless people in the area? Have they stuck around? Have they moved out? Have they been recipients of, of the CAN projects? Have they remained recipients even when other residents have actually, you know, gone back to work? What, what does it look like between the different CANs? Thank cool. you. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, uh, in, this, in the Salt River CAN, one of the main initial issues um, that we focused on was 
providing foods for folks who were homeless in Salt River. And there were a lot more people um, who moved into the area. And I think on the whole, homelessness was quite a big issue. In fact, there was even a homelessness can because there were so many people who were pushed out of their homes during this time, either because they were backyarders and they could no longer afford rent or because of COVID fears. A lot of people were pushed out with nowhere to go. There was also the kind of Strandfontein disaster, which may have been why some people left Woodstock and then came back. So um, from the perspective of the Salt River Can, we, for about three months, we were delivering food to about 300 people a day, hot meals to um, folks who lived on the street in Salt River. There were kind of camps of people who'd set up who didn't live here before and do now. Some have stayed and some have moved on. Um, also my neighboring can in observatory, the OBS can set up a group called OBS can feed you if you let it. Um, and one of the main focuses of their work has been finding ways to work with all the residents in observatory, whether they live in established homes or on the streets um, to develop sort of interventions to address food insecurity. And there are some really great sort of cooperative kind of approaches that have had, I think, quite extraordinary success. So one, one such group um, it's known as Africa 70, OBS can feed you. And that's, uh, yeah, it's a collective of people, some of whom live on the street and some of whom live in established homes, who've been working together on this food project. Um, anybody in the area can order cooked meals from them twice a week. If you can afford to pay for the food, you do. If you can't to pay for the, afford to pay for the food, then it's given to you for free. And so there's a sort of a cross-subsidization mechanism. The OBS can feed you guys are also providing a hot meal on the green every day at five, including some other kind of interventions. So the Salt River Can has sort of not been able to sustain some of the, the kind of the, um, the feeding initiatives assisting homeless folks in the area. But the OBS Can Feed You people have really been doing some extraordinary work. So, yeah, that's what's been happening around here. Thanks. Over. Thanks so much, Diana. Thanks for telling us a bit more about some of the work that's been, been going on with you. Um, just shout panelists as well if you have any questions that you've seen on the chat that you'd like specifically to answer. Um, Otherwise, I think moving on to the next question is one that we've just got from, from a hit that's, that's asking kind of about NGOs. I know, Nadia, you've answered him a bit on the chat, but maybe Mohit, if you could um, unmute yourself and ask a bit more, and then perhaps Nadia could, could give a full answer on that. Are you there, Mahit? You're unable to unmute yourself. Okay, well, I can I also have to just read it. Hello, I, uh, I think I'll give it a go. I think um, entities, government institutions, and NGOs, in South Cairns, um, we um, across networks, um, there's no hierarchy, um, we're not registered, and I think that might have impacted people not being willing to assist Cairns. I'm not sure um, if that was the case, but um, I feel that that is it. A, a requirement is for you to get funding or assistance is to be registered yourself and we really um, not about because the minute we in experience has shown the minute you start structuring something um, all kind of politics comes into play and it's just sometimes just better to carry on the way that we have been carrying on but it's not a cut and paste module as Leanna said earlier so what works for one can might not work for another. Thank you, Nadia, and I, yeah, I like the idea of it's not cut and paste, and I think Kansas is a true example of that in the completely different responses that, that each can has had. Um, another question that I saw was from, from Terence about vaccines. So Terence, if you can are- I just yeah. quickly come in? Sorry, oh, I was sorry. having connectivity issues. My, I was trying to connect. My apologies. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that, and I completely agree that uh, you know, registrations and formalizations and bureaucracy can take away uh, and be detrimental in some way. But I was also thinking more about 
you know, access, you know, the kind of soft but extremely potent resources that these established uh, organizations have, which can provide runway for CANs to get self-organizing in ways that amplify their voices. For example, you know, access to spaces in, uh, in a faster way. Networks, they have access to politicians acting as intermediaries that can bring a level of trust and, and social capital that can help you then not be seen as a threat to existing political structures. You know, uh, then other soft skills like influence, being given, get, you know, helping cans get faster credibility and recognition by acting as intermediaries for ideas and proposals that might otherwise be seen as being too disruptive. You know, so just, j just those kinds of things as well in terms of the collaborations that can potentially happen, even if it's not a very strict uh, funder fundy relationship. So just thoughts on those, on, on those fronts, you know, if there is alignment with values, then are there softer ways of working together like you've mentioned, you know, the Joint Peace Forum had six years of credibility that it brought with it to self-organize the can and be so effective. Then thinking about the NGOs that have such immense clout, how do you leverage that and piggyback off that so that then you're able to leverage uh, the greater policy frameworks and shake them up as they need to be shaken over? I'm happy to jump in there real quick. I just um, want to come in briefly oh. and say that, um, yes, we have. Go ahead, Leanne, go ahead. You go for it, Nadia, I'll go after. Okay, I just wanted to say that self-organizing in essence, I think, and this is my humble opinion, it's not a Cape Town Together opinion, um, or even the opinion of my camp. Um, self-organizing is threatening to the powers that be, um, regardless of what political, political sphere they're in, I think um, we threaten them, we pose a threat uh, to them. And even though they've engaged with us on several levels, um, one party always accuses us of being affiliated to another party, regardless of how often we say that we are apolitical, um, we're merely doing things um, for community. But um, I think it's because of that threat that people are sometimes not willing to support um, such organizations. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Nadia. I think that definitely is a factor. But I think the other part um, is that many people from different organizations are involved in their local CAN as well. And so what we've seen is people can get involved in their local can and leave some of their institutional organizational baggage at the door. And suddenly the barriers to collaboration are not as sort of as stringent as they would be with a formal organizational partnership. And so I think, I mean, your question, um, Mohit, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, was about how to leverage some of that. And I think, in fact, the sort of the ways in which the, the kind of network has sort of had such far reaching effect is because those kind of network of networks have been leveraged. A lot of people um, in organizations, whether that be in the public service or in NGOs, were also involved in their local CAN, bringing sort of years of experience, relationships, learnings, networks to that, um, to a specific organizing um, kind of uh, process. And so I guess we sometimes think of things um, the, sometimes we think of things in ways that have to be extremely formal and MOUs and accountability frameworks and mechanisms, but actually what we've seen here is when we move at the speed of trust is a phrase we use quite a lot, which really is about centering the importance of relationships in how we work. And sometimes moving at the speed of trust is very fast and sometimes it's slow, depending, but we have sort of accountability mechanisms that are relational in nature and that kind of allows for leveraging of 
long-standing work and partnerships um, that are locally based in, in different neighborhoods. So yeah, that would be my answer to that as well. But I agree with Nadia. I think there's something about the power of self-organizing that does leave um, certain powers at be feeling threatened because they can't imagine that people are sort of without having somebody sort of commanding and controlling in the way that an organization works. They can't imagine that people can be sort of similarly moving sort of in tandem despite not having sort of a clear recipe of what's expected um, of them. Thank you so much, Diana. I think very important lessons there about informal and formal networks. Thank you. And thank you, Nadia and Hans, too. Um, I think that actually is a good brings us to the next part of our session. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but thank you all. We had some really insightful, interesting questions, and I wish we had more more time to chat with the panelists and explore that more, but hopefully they'll they'll be around for the breakout rooms now, which is the next part of the session that we're moving to. Um, so first of all, a massive thank you to, to all of our panelists again for sharing your precious time and insight. It really has been a pleasure to learn from you.